So I'm moving away from plants and talk a bit about insects. And I know nothing about insects, so you have to bear with me. Um, I apologize for the colors of the slides because I think there's some of the stuff that you won't be able to see. So South Africa is a very diverse country. Uh, we have three biodiversity hotspots within the country. And yesterday I was telling you that we have 22,000 plant species in the country. So it's quite diverse, the fauna and the flora. But we also have a well-protected uh, area network in the country, or we would like to think we have one, of 1,527 national parks, reserves, nature reserves, uh, wilderness areas, heritage sites. And of these, we have 19 national parks. And you, most of you, have been to at least one of them, the Kruger National Park, which you can see there. Um, but the problem with our national parks is that they were actually selected on land that was available and not really to capture the biodiversity in, in the area. So this is actually a big problem for us. And I'm just going to demonstrate quickly in two slides for you what I mean by this by using plants as an example, which is one of the best um, examples in South Africa. Um, best sampled, um, studied examples in South Africa. It's work done by one of my PhD students. So if we want to see uh, to what degree do we actually conserve our endemic flora in these um, protected areas, and you look at this map, you will see that only 67% of our um, endemic flora are protected in these uh, networks. And the, of these 67%, 80% of these taxa is actually least concerned. So for us, this is a big problem that we're not conserving our flora. And if you look at this map, I can't really see here, is that only 47% of the country's uh, plants have actually been um, collected or sampled. Um, the red areas indicating the areas sampled. And what especially interesting for me, is if we look at DNA sequences and we compare this to the plants that's been collected uh, um, in South Africa, the endemic flora, only 39% of them have DNA sequences available. So there's still large gaps in plants, and this is what we think is the best studied taxonomic group. So what about insects? This is now where I'm on dangerous territory. Okay. <laughs> especially with these Malay traps that everybody has. So definitely, we, we have a shortage of data. I did go and look in the literature, everything that I could see about insects, about what is the numbers in the parks, especially in the Kruger Park. And I can't really get exact dates, except for a publication that go back to 1995, that say that we have 44, uh, 43,565 um, insect species in South Africa. We, I think I say in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's an estimated 100,000. So um, this is, and then I looked at what is available in our parks. Is there actually projects on invertebrates in the parks? And obviously our focus here would be the Kruger, and there's only 17 uh, projects on invertebrates registered in the park, and one of them, I guess, is your project, Paul. So this is quite um, alarming for such a big group that have such little um, projects. And what's actually, if you look at this here, the, uh, representing the different parks, you will see that all the sexy parks next to the coast have the projects. So people tend to go to the uh, more attractive parks. <coughs> And here you can see the different groups and how many projects are registered in, in Sandbox. So in these 19 parks, it's not the whole network, it's just the 19 national parks. So we really, when we were at the Kruger during the conference, Paul was talking about this project, and we really want to use the Kruger Park as a, a model project that we could sell 
two sandbox so that we can go and barcode our not other national parks and really get an inventory of what is available on invertebrates for in Southern Africa. So we started the Kruger Malays project. I'm not sure, I think it's Michelle that designed the, the, the logo. Um, it's quite a big area. I mean, you've been there, it's 19,000 square kilometers. So it's a big area to cover. And I will explain to you how did we tackle this. So and obviously our, our main aim was to, to describe the diversity in the park and also the biomass of atropods. This was a, we decided to have a one year project and collection would take place every week. And we were aiming first to put out 25 traps across the park. Eventually, I think we set up 26 um, Malay traps. So with the main aims of ob objectives, first was to show that DNA barcoding enable rapid low cost evaluations of species composition of atropods. I forgot to mention earlier that there's an estimate that in South Africa they describe about 250 invertebrates per year. So it's a very slow process. We have good taxonomists in the country. So we really want to have a method where we can capture this diversity very quickly. And then to quantify seasonal and spatial patterns of variation, um, baseline data that we can provide for uh, community structure and species diversity, to evaluate future changes like, for instance, climate change, and then also to help South Africa and all to, <laughs> to for our obligations under CBD. Okay, so I'm first going to introduce you to the team in, in South Africa. I know this is here, but Michelle is spending lots of time with us. So this is the local team that goes out in the, uh, to the park. It was quite a big process for Michelle and Ryan to set up the logistics, because like I said, it's quite a, a big park. So if you travel from the south to the north, you can travel two days because you can't drive faster than uh, 50 kilometers. And then Ra uh, Ryan is leaving us within the next two weeks, so Ross will take over, um, and they will collect with um, Sandy Sele in the park. And then obviously, the help of all the rangers. So uh, Michelle had to talk to all the section rangers in the park. There's 22 section rangers in the park organized for them that they actually will have the traps at the houses in their sections because obviously if the baboons will damage it. So far we haven't lost the trap, so quite lucky and it's been up since May. So really we were very surprised by these people that's really volunteering to help us. We, the Kruger has such a big problem with poaching of rhinos that they're actually uh, willing to help us catch insects. So obviously there's a big team here at Guelph also that helps with the sequencing that I didn't put all the faces. Um, okay, so this is just to give you an idea of where we set up the, the traps. And you can see it's really from the southern part up to Crook's Corner right at the top. Um, it's also covering most of the vegetation types, 11 of the 15 vegetation types. I'm saying we've deployed 26 Malay traps. I think the one A at the top was deployed a little bit later, so we haven't got data in for it. It's just the furry one, and one we got data later on, starting, they started later on. So, um, so obviously in May we started the project, uh, deployed the traps, because Paul was in a hurry, because he wants to talk at Norwalk about it. Um, <laughs> And then in July, we went to collect the first batch of samples, and uh, we collected 194 samples, so it's from the 24 traps. Um, again, on some um, um, section ranges started a week or two later, but this is basically what it looked like. You could see the trap, you could see the house there at the back, so they really have to try and keep them close to the houses. 
So uh, first results that coming out, here you can see in the lab where Ross is busy decanting the ethanol to send the samples over to, to Guelph, quite a process. It took him probably a week to do all of that. But you could see here that on average, we have eight samples per site, which make it about 175 specimens per sample that we got so far. So sequence recovery in quality, this was actually quite good. You will see uh, here, if you look at this, you can see here we have 83 sequences that are specimens that actually produce sequences. And of the 83%, we had 70% that had sequences longer than 500 base pairs, and that resulted in an OTU assignment. So it was quite good recovery. If we look at the sequencing success, I uh, can't really see the map, but uh, just look at the spots here. Uh, sequencing su uh, success at these different sites. Very alarming is this Shangoni um, site here where we had less than 70% sequencing success. And obviously, either Michelle or Michelle, one of the two of us, We'll have to go back there and see what are going wrong, what's going wrong there. Maybe there's a problem with the sampling strategy, or I believe that the road there is very bad, but I can't see that the sh shaking will do anything about it. But overall, very good sequencing success. And then if we look at the OTUs that was um, recovered, we had on average 49 per site. And also this uh, related to 24 unique OTUs per site. In total, 768 unique OTUs. So you can see uh, the shape. I don't know. Can you see, actually? Okay. Uh, the number of uh, families identified was also quite high, 117. And here you can see the most OT, uh, OTU-rich families. Uh, most of them, yeah, and that there are three of them actually in that. And then, um, if we look at this OTU sorry, accumulation curve, it is estimated that we still need to collect at least 60% um, of the OTUs. And I think, Jeremy, this is work that you've done in Michalisburg, I'm not sure. So if we compare it with the results that was um, obtained in Michalisburg and we correct it for the same similar specimen numbers, we can estimate that in the Kruger, the OTUs is approximately 6,000 OTUs that we could get out of there. So for me, this is quite... Um, interesting and unique because remember I said we have 44,000, more or less 44,000 known species in the country or named species in the country. It takes us to, uh, a year to just um, do 250, add 250 taxa to it. So now with this Kruger project we can actually um, uncover 14% of the known diversity in the park within a single year. So this is quite fast, and this is one of the objectives that we have set for us. Two minutes, I'm almost done. So um, just to summarize, so overall, the sequencing success was quite good. Um, we obviously have to go back to some of the, the sites to go and try and train the people to do um, the sampling better for us, if it's possible. Um, the diversity that we've uncovered so far is quite high, 768 unique OTUs. So we're happy with that. And like I said, in the next two weeks, we will go back to get the next batch of samples. It's getting summer now, so I assume we're going to get full bottles and we might have to go and change the samples twice a week. And then February, May is the last um, collection for this. And then just the last slide that I want to show you, and I've heard Ian said he's involved in the project also, is there's also note how the Global Spore Sampling Project that has just started. 
So if you are interested to put up one of these silicone samplers, Paul wants numbers, so we really have to work on this. <laughs> so um, currently there's about 50 um, sites across all the continents. The project started uh, the 1st of October, but I'm sure they will still allow you to set up some of these traps. So this is really to collect fungi and to get our numbers higher for, for our targets. So thank you.